Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 217. That's dos, uno, siete, right? Okay, hopefully I got that right there. Como estas, my fellow listeners? Hope you guys are well. <coughs> Hydrating all that malarkey. As you can tell, I'm not that well. I'm actually suffering from um, a severe case of allergies because of this nice summer humid um, weather that we're having at the moment in, in England. We usually don't have the best weather, you know, around here. I'm sure you guys are aware England's a bit of a, um, you know, a, it's a bit unpredictable when it comes to weather, especially during the summer months. But this year has been pretty good. It's been really hot, really warm for the most part. But for people like me who suffer from allergies, it's been probably one of the worst times to be alive because, you know, because most of the time I've spent, I spent outside because I'm running a lot, going to the gym, moving around, DJing and shit. So I'm always putting myself at harm's way for the old pollen attacks. Oh, Jesus Christ. So I'm going to take all of these allergy tablets right now on camera because I need to get myself back in line. But the issue with these allergy tablets is that, um, again, I'll ask for some help and some assistance from the interwebs. If anyone out there knows of any allergy tablets I can get pretty easily, whether online or in boots, that are non-drowsy but also work as well as this brand that I have here at the moment, which is called uh, Pirit, Pirit Z. Pirit Z, how you pronounce that? If anyone knows of a brand that's better than this but uh, supplies me with non-drowsy pills, then please suggest, please leave a comment down below. Um, I'll be much, much appreciated. The reason I asked because... Um, these pills, they're really drowsy, but they're really effective. The ones that I bought that are non-drowsy, whether it's the own brand um, Boots version or this other one I bought from Boots before, don't work as well as a, as the drowsy version. So I, I don't know what that is about. I know I had some pills I got from Madrid um, a few months ago that were really good and they were non-drowsy. But again, that was in Madrid and they were massive doses. I think they were 20 milligrams just for one pill. So I have to take two of these um, UK ones. But if anyone can find anything similar in the UK that I can purchase quite easily, please let your boy know because I'm suffering out here, man. Suffering, 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 suffering. And again, allergies are weird because I never had this before, you know. This is a thing that happened, like, what, within the last few years or so? I was never the allergy kid. Um, I spent most of my time outside, you know. I grew up a bit of a latch dog, a latch, latch key kid, right, uh, for the most part. I was allowed to kind of go around and be feral from like nine to nine in the <laughs> during the weekends, which involved me going to the park, hanging out, playing football, and just generally just, you know, being a kid. And I never once had any kind of allergy or allergic reaction to anything, right? And then suddenly in my older age, I don't know why this happened. I don't know if it's because of alcohol or it's because of diets or whatever. Something changed within my body where suddenly now I'm susceptible to um, pollen and all that sort of shit. And now I'm sneezing and stuff. And it makes it difficult because, <coughs> as you can tell by my raspberry throat, I was coughing a lot last night. But mostly just because of, you know, that dry, easy cough you get when you got an allergy. Which hasn't been helped because I've been running back from home. I've been running back to um to my house um from work every Monday. Um, I've done it for two weeks in a row now so far. I'm gonna keep doing it every Monday. Um, I work uh, kind of around the Shoreditch area, so I can run back. It's about four miles and a half, maybe five miles if I take a different route. And that's not really helping the situation because obviously you know car pollution and shit, rush hour traffic, pollen in the air, and all that malarkey. So um yeah, but it's a lot better than in the morning. In the morning, it's ridiculous. Like I, I there's been times where. <coughs> I've had to pull aside the side. I've had to pull. I've had to step aside on the side of the street and kind of hold my chest and gather my breath because I was literally feeling as if my chest was contracting. Feeling I was going, I'm gonna have a heart attack, which you know, of course I wasn't. But you know, you never know these things. So yeah, any tips for allergy pills? Please put them down in the comments below. Anyway, we're gonna get right into it because I don't have much time today, as um, per usual, work has taken a lot of time out of my schedule, which is annoying to say the least. But again, we're gonna make. It do with what time we have available, not complain about the present, and try and fix it any way we can, right? That's the main, main, main name of the game. No complaining, just trying to fix the situation as best you can. So, let's get into some topics. Let's see what I've got here. Put this coffee down over here. Bish, bash, bosh. Okay, so, number one. Nego king shit only. So, Nego, my um, hero... Somebody that I've been obsessed with for a long, long time. So much so that I've got this old book. I'll show you one second. Anyone that's grew up, anyone that grew up in the, you know, 
or anyone that's obsessed with streetwear, not even like grew up in a particular era. I think if you're obsessed with streetwear, like I am, or you're a fan of you know street culture, especially Japanese streetwear culture and all that sort of stuff, you would have been familiar, or you would have come across Nico and a Baby Nape story somewhere along the line. For me, it was a more a little bit more of an organic process, or something that happened just you know through proxy of me being around. Because I got into it quite early or just during the inception of these brands starting or becoming popular within Europe and within North America, I was kind of absorbed. Like, Nigo was like the, the main dude that you were kind of obsessed with when it came to your baby name because he was essentially did what all streetwear companies want to do or brands want to do. He created an entire world around a baby name, right? Loads of different sub labels with his baby Milo, um, all these other stuff that he done previously. The footwear, the accessories, the furniture, the art installations, the art collaborations, limited edition t shirts, on and on and on and on and on. Right, big brand collaborations like the Marvel Bapses. Like he was at the forefront of really pushing streetwear culture worldwide and global. So much so he linked up with Pharrell, who at the time was on an incredible production run. Neptunes and Star Trek were kind of influencing sound throughout the entirety of hip hop, maybe even pop culture or pop in general right christian Aguilera, christian christina aguilera britney spears had tracks with him pink had tracks with uh, pharrell and you know that marriage with pharrell and nigo basically uh, was a fusion between west and east right meeting together and essentially that's what birthed the pharrell that we know now in terms of what he's doing in streetwear and fashion with his brands and it also cemented nigo's legacy of course didn't end too well right some financial hardships rumors about why it happened there's no point speaking about that, but he, it didn't go the way he planned it to go. And naturally, I think, you know, what, it, it went probably the way he, he meant to go. Because I think a lot of Japanese brands do this. Like they have a really good sense of when to kind of pull the trigger or when to pull back or when to pause a brand or when to kind of sack it off. Like, you know, Hiroshi Fujiwara has like probably more than 10 brands he started and fin and kind of ended himself, right? Just because he wanted to, right? Because it's just more than an exercise, a project. And he wanted maybe to prove to himself that he could do it or they use brands as a way to kind of, um, as a way to boost their CV, right? Um, oh, I can do this small thing. I can produce a, a streetwear brand. I can produce a streetwear brand with a particular sort of aesthetic or a menswear brand, or whatever it may be. So a baby name kind of fell by the wayside. Nigo kind of pulled out I don't think he got, um, you know, as well compensated for it as he should have. But, you know, as a, as a Supreme Creative, that was no worry. He stuck himself down and then started a uh, human made. Uh, but prior, obviously, Baby Nip is, again, my inspiration. I've got this old kind of catalog from back in the day. I think it's from 2004 and five. I forgot what year this is from, actually. Uh, doesn't it seem, anyway, it's a massive book. They did a lot of this before, little booklets and, that they kind of did. They showed off some of the um, furniture that he made, right? Um, it's got some furniture in there. You no know, tables like I'm showing you now here that he's done collaborations with or stuff that's in his collection. I'm always a big fan of. This is the peak of materialism back in streetwear, right? When people are just trying to collect oh, well, mass as much thing as possible. Now people are a little bit more conscious, I think, of what they're buying and probably don't want to show off their wealth. Maybe it's coming back around a little bit, but this was back in the day when it was that thing. There's Nigo again with James Lavelle with a... Is that a Yasika camera? Of course it is. No, it's not. It's a Leica, right? Jira. Yeah, so again, there's Nigo here. Took the pictures of James Lavelle. Legend as well in streetwear and all those things in between. You've got some toys here. Cause collaboration toys that he's done back in the day too that are awesome. Just an amazing catalogue altogether, all right? You've got some store design stuff that I'm sure some people have probably ripped off in their own store as well, right? I forgot the architecture firm that does... Um, most of the Japanese stores brand most of the Japanese brand stores but they're really amazing they're similar to the dude I forgot his name the guy that did the New York thing store Raphael something right he did a New York thing store he did the rec center he did I think supreme he did a couple of bars and restaurants really prolific architects and interior designers who's basically been able to kind of you know work hand in hand with these brands to bring their brand to vision right and again he blows a baby name so anyway he does a human made now. One of my favorite brands out there. It's a little bit on the pricey side. Again, I think for most streetwear fans, maybe I've, yeah, I'll say it's a pretty on the price side for most people. I'd say um again, all well made, mostly made in Japan, extremely well put together. Um, the sizing has improved over the seasons. I remember touching a few or trying on a few of the stuff beforehand, and it was it used to fit like you know your conventional old school Japanese brand. Anyone that's tried on the soloist stuff will know what I'm talking about, right? It's extremely short on the body, extremely short on the arms. XLs fit like mediums. You know I mean, it's not for the big boys. But human made is a bit is made a bit more boxy. I think because he's got more European accounts. He started to kind of uh, <coughs> change the cut of some of the stuff. So a lot of it looks better, especially because now you're seeing a lot of it pop up on reselling sites before. 
he didn't miss to get any of it because of course it didn't fit too well but now it's fitting a lot better and um hype is just uh posted up the full winter 19 collection and yeah um all that's been resumed in it just high level shit man again um it just goes to show just how high level some of these japanese uh designers are i've got this here now available on the screen but i'll, sh I'll link it in the show notes so you can listen via the audio again um just supremely well put together uh great head to toe looks um you got here on the left you got the quintessential kind of you know nigo staple or streetwear staple in the coach jacket with some high water trousers and um these look like george cox collaboration um shoes i think for the looks of it you've got another here with a slide with a yellow hoodie human made on the front with these amazing olive uh i'm not sure if they're combat pants or whatever the trainers also look pretty cool i think there's aiden's collaboration I'm, i remember seeing pharrell wearing them right the trainers with the little hearts in the front of them um again just great stuff all around you've got this amazing camo hoodie which is awesome i didn't see this before Okay, he's made he's made a, a little flip on the camo on the babe camo that he obviously popularized back in the day. That must again that must be something to that must be I wonder what how you feel as a creative if you created babe camo and then you had to kind of you essentially got kicked out of your own brand. You can't take any of the inter intellectual property with you and you gotta restart again from scratch. I wonder how that what that does to the ego, man. Like babe camo is essentially like I don't know, that was the the pinnacle of all over print, man. Like Candy Floss Camo is still one of my grails, right? That hoodie is amazing. Uh, the original babe camo, especially the sand color, the yellow colorway in the snowball jacket, is like one of the best pieces I've ever seen in my life. It still goes for big bucks on Yahoo JP, like it's insane. But yeah, he's done a good flip of it now. Essentially, it's the babe head camo with just a human made logo, kind of that heart logo put in it, which looks really cool. Again, a great MA1 jacket, just staple, amazing Japanese streetwear kind of staples in there. You've got the Adidas Campus 80s that he's always been a fan of. Again, popularized by the Beastie Boys. Loads of hip-hop influences there that you can't really go um, remiss for, really, in that regard. Uh, great little olive jacket here. Those high waters, nice converse. This camo jacket is one of my favorites as well. Um, your quintessential camo M65 with the human-made hearts all over it. Perfect. The jeans as well. The perfect wash, right, for the most part. Whoops, sorry about that. The jeans, whoop, whoop, again, sorry about that. <laughs> this is all for the perfect wash. The two... Um, nice jeans there great trainers next slide what do we have here and again a nice um what what are those jackets called they're, there's a they're state point street there right they're kind of overall kind of work work, work jacket right there's supreme do a few of them as well with a zip it's usually like a it's usually like a stiff cotton as well maybe it's wax sometimes too uh those george cox shoes look amazing by the way there's um uh, i do like these kind of red wingy type boots more though um i don't think those george cox shoes will kind of look good with my massive boat feet but again who knows again that classic kind of you know varsity jacket from human made i think pharrell probably i mean so i think nigo is probably up there with some of the with one of the best designers or pattern cutters whatever you want to call it of putting together a varsity jacket they fit so well I had a couple, well, I had two old school babe jackets. That, again, I regret selling about jackets, though. Just fit amazing. How they come up um, on the waist, the way they fit on the arms, like a bit of a longer arm. They can't fit on the waist. The pockets are the perfect side, perfect um, position for you to put your hands in. Just, just perfect stuff to snap oh the buttons as well another pet peeve of mine sometimes varsity jackets i think maybe because of the heaviness of the actual body the pops don't really hold the jacket together too well so some of them have to have a zip which makes it you know uncomfortable to wear but for real i mean nigo again i've kissed it for nigo has a good way of making the pops really durable and really kind of sticky so they kind of clip on really hard um again just genius shit this jacket on the right is just amazing it reminds me of the old color i had a shirt similar to this too it's, like, it's an old bathing ape color block long sleeve shirt so each panel of the shirt was a different color i think i had one that was each panel of the shirt was a different camo which well was fucking beautiful this is sort of like a denim jacket sort of like chore jacket thing every panel is a different sort of color as well like just genius level stuff again great converses looking type shoe which i when i wish i could wear but my feet are too wide unfortunately um again great looks here left and right and amazing I, lo I love the kind of heart motif he's kind of done as well the bondage pants you have there i love the jacket too it reminds me a little bit of the kvm jacket sort of like a uh, a duffel what's it called um a padded coat down jacket sort of vibe uh, nice sweats the campus 80s look really nice there too um this human made jumper with um hook with no hoodie on it with the little collar is fucking beautiful the pants as well look great that suit is nice with the corduroy just again killer collection is all white look is all one of my favorites so i recommend you check it out um a, a human made four into 19 
loads of great pieces in it. This bag as well is stupendous, isn't it? Look at that. I wonder if it's a headport club, or maybe not. Yeah, a great, great collection overall. One of one of my favorites out there. Again, you can't go wrong. There is, there is a, you know, there are levels to this um, streetwear shit, and Nigo is obviously up there with the best of them, if not the best. So definitely check it out. Um, one of my favorite collections so far that I've seen for four into nineteen from Human Made. Um, what's next here on the list? You know what? Let me get rid of this. Boom, boom, boom too many windows open at the moment so sometimes when you click the wrong screen it goes on something you don't want people to see but anyway um so next here we have from one great brand to a brand that's dying on its feet but has produced something out of the blue so as i mentioned previously nigo was um used to be what was the founder of or is the founder of uh, a baby nate but unfortunately was ousted from his own company due to some financial difficulties right and now that Chinese um, management or investment group IT who's also invested in Hypebeast and other things they're now sort of like managing it and I don't know if they're essentially freelancing the entire design process to loads of different small agencies or if they've got a small in design fashion uh, design team that kind of put stuff together because I know that was the strength of the baby nape and some of the biggest Japanese brands we know out there like Visvim or even Double Taps Neighborhood the reason why they, they've been so consistent over the years is that they keep a they have like a small design team that's been with them for you know decades and decades and decades who are who kind of have a, a deep understanding of the design codes and what goes into making some of their best pieces so with the direction with some of the with some of the main men whether it's Tet whether it's Shin they're able to kind of steer the ship but the supporting characters are able to kind of keep it chugging along right by making really cool trousers in different colors maybe some socks accessories loads of miscellaneous items that are able to kind of support the mainstays that maybe some of the that the mainstays that maybe shin and nigo have more influence over right um so that was the strength of it but obviously over the years baby nape has kind of suffered by the wayside due to nigo's brilliance being pulled away from it and it seems as if over the preceding years i think as soon as nigo left or he got kicked out baby nape had still had a bit of a good run like i think it was about I'm going to say two to four years where they were still putting that consistently good stuff. But then it felt as if as soon as a window was over, it started to go downwards, right? And it, and it made me think that what ended up happening was that when IT absorbed or when that um, a Chinese company absorbed um, Bevin Ape into its cockholds, right, or into its organization, a lot of the designers probably couldn't handle working underneath those conditions, right? Maybe it wasn't as relaxed as it was back in the day at the, you know, at the Nowhere Studios, whatever it's called. And they kind of got, you know, a, a bit uh, disenfranchised and decided to leave. And then they've hired all these other people outside of the brand to come and do the do the, the COVID, which has been a complete disaster. If you've seen some of the Adidas clubs they've done, it's been some hot garbage. The Puma stuff was incredibly buff-worthy. Just really shitty things, right? Just plastering the camera everywhere. But this sort of stuff is something I think works out really, really well, right? So this is um, uh, a new collection I've just seen pop up on Hypebeast. And it's, it says, the title says the following. Uh, Babe drops a range of um, ABC camo, uh, do rags, and shooting sleeves, right, for 4 to 19. And if you know anything about Baby Nape, you know the hip hop roots, you know how obsessed Nigo was with hip hop or Americana culture in general, you know that these do rags really do fall in line exactly with when um, the Baby Nape used to be. And if anything, this is probably the best thing I've seen Baby Nape do in ages. This is, again, this is outside of, because they had a good run where they were reissuing loads of staples. So they would reissue some of the um, down jackets, a leather kind of down jacket that a lot of people used to wear back in the day. They reissued the snowball jackets. They reissued some of the uh, boots, some of the jeans, some of the hoodies. So they had a, there's a core range, even it's highlighted in this book actually. There's a core range, right, of Baby Nate products that they always do season in, season out which they were kind of reissuing for a while, but then they stopped doing it after a period of time. They decided to start making, you know, those dead Puma jackets that people were starting to wear. Because again, did, who, did, who did you see wearing those Puma babe jackets apart from people that got seeded it? Honestly, they were so garbage, no? I think I saw AJ Tracy wearing it once on the video or something. And that was it. I've not seen anyone in real life wearing it who wasn't seeded it, right? It's all kind of CD people. People that look like they, they get free stuff while wearing it. But no one actually bought it with their own money. Like, I don't think they would anyway, because it's horrendous. But these durags are great. Really awesome. Um, again, not sure how much they're going to be. Price-wise, availability at Malaki. But just as a look, and just from, again, inspiration-wise, reference-wise, they are incredible. Um, would love to see them in different camo colors. Maybe, like, in blue, red, and all that Malaki. And maybe purple. That would look flipping sick. But again, really well done. Oh, this year it is. It's in red. Okay, awesome. They got it in the dark green. They got it in the blue. 
they got in the black see the dark dead colors yeah, I mean, they should have just making the, the staples the purple as well but anyway they got shooting sleeves for people do that play basketball and shit i've never understood what shooting sleeves are for i guess the same like compression tights for your calves right there's must be some science towards them but i never got the whole compression sleeve thing i think you'd be a bit of a wild to wear compression sleeves not playing basketball right it's not really a thing but then it must be because there's kids especially american kids who wear like sweatbands and they're not working out which is very bizarre but again you know everyone's got their way of doing things so yeah um again but the do for me the do rags are a standout piece that that is obviously the that that kind of sandy color is probably the best color way i'd say for the most part it's not even on here is it right yeah so why is it so much lighter in the picture huh but anyway um these do rags are amazing a big fan of them hopefully um when they come out i'll have a chance to cop not sure if that's going to be possible though but um what date is it due to come out they've got a date here uh july 8th supposedly so they're meant to come out yesterday um so we're gonna see yeah so hopefully we'll see those coming out very very soon um baby nape do rags for four into 19 again some of the easy the best thing they've done in a while because you know it's been a bit of a hard slog for babe since nigo um was ousted from his company but so far it looks like some of the people that are working there have finally figured out how to make it work um next on the list here we have ba, 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 ba. what do we have here oh we have pod share. This is an interesting one, right? Oh, my head is itchy. So let me get this up here. Let me actually just move this around. So, um, pod share. This little thing. This um, this interesting startup popped up on my um Twitter feed the other day, which I've been, you know, I've been using Twitter a lot recently, more so than Instagram. I've deleted Instagram from my phone for the most part. I didn't wasn't really posting on there to be honest or browsing, but you know, there's always those times you catch yourself just drifting away, scrolling up and down. Twitter, I have more of an easy way of kind of pulling away because mostly people just shouting or talking about politics, which kind of gets boring. So it's easier to not check that too often. I have quite a good work, uh, willpower when it comes to Twitter, but Instagram is a lot harder because, you know, you've got your friends on there. Sometimes you're curious or you're a bit of a voyeur. You want to find out what they're getting up to. So you kind of, you know, pop in, pop out. So I've been using Twitter mostly. And it's quite in and it's interesting startup pops up on my feed. Again, startups for the most part, I've had a bit of a rocky relationship with them so far. You know, I just left one recently that was, you know, didn't pay us and stuff. And I'm at one now that's a bit shaky as well. Startups have a really weird place in my heart. I love them because they've allowed me to build my CV, to gain valuable experience, to work in an industry that I'm really passionate about. And eventually I will have my own company doing something in some way, shape or form. Cool. But the way they do business is a bit dodgy. And sometimes the need that they're addressing is new, not usually something anyone that actually is actually wants right or is actually requesting it's usually something that's just like a, a selfish pursuit that they're hoping that they can somehow prove that a technology or a proposition that they think of works and then you know there's have validity in it and then the hope is a vc can come in but you know invest loads of money into it get it to a stage where they get bought out by another company absorbed by another company and, and exit right that's usually the, the goal for most startups that are just kind of starting up now it's not really a passion project it's not answering the desired need it's just a, a big cash grab no 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 uh bones about that either but it's interesting when you see a startup pop up that's actually addressing a need and a need that people don't really want to admit is actually there. And I think PodShare is a really good example of it. So it's essentially uh, bunk beds that you share in a shared housing um, area. And essentially, you um, the housing um, situation is, I think they pay like £1,200 a month. You get a bunk bed in basically a hostel, it looks like, for the most part. And then all the amenities are kind of supplied to you by the management company. So they provide bread, milk, coffee, sugar, all the bases that you need. And then you get to pay £1,200 a month, $1,200. And then you get to kind of live in the middle of San Francisco, Silicon Valley, with next to a startup you want to work for. So an inter okay, interesting proposition, but for people that aren't very um, tapped in with the startup world and don't understand the importance of Silicon Valley and why it might be crucial for you to work near there, it can sound a bit gross that you'd be li essentially living in a bunk bed with other grown adults just because you want to, you know, get the, your dream job. But there's some validity in it. And this video kind of shows it. In its full firm. So let's get this up here and then we can talk about it on the other side. Podshare is affordable shared housing that we build across Los Angeles and here in San Francisco is our first site. The idea is and, and this speaking now is um, for those of you listening about the podcast app, um, this is a video titled uh, Tenants Pay $1,200 a Month to Rent um, These Bunk Beds. And it's a video from CNN Business. The person here speaking now is the founder, Evelina Beck. 
And again, it's an it's a it's a it's an area that people don't really want to admit that there's a problem with, and they don't want to admit that there's actually people out there willing to do this. But I think what she's providing, and the fact that for the most part it looks completely full, goes to show that there is uh an, there is a need for affordable housing, housing in the most com- housing in the most basic of manner, right? Because mostly people here are single, they don't have any family or pets. Um, they're essentially kind of trying to make their career they're trying to make it in the industry and all they need is basically a bed for the most part so they can sleep because most of the time they spent in the startup working ungodly hours trying to get something from to, trying to get something off the ground right so this has got a lot of validity in it and again addresses a need that i think has been um not addressed in in any way shape or form so if you book a pod you can stay across the whole network of locations I was born in the USSR in 1995. My whole concept was, like the idea of the government giving you everything in a communist state, what if you could subscribe to a housing membership and have all your needs met? In the fridge, there should just be like cereal, ramen, you know, collegiate foods, and there should be, always be toothpaste and toilet paper, and just these basic things that you just need to live, like they should just be handled for you. And that's kind of the concept of pod share. You just share pods across a network with people that become your friends which is cool because the, the the thing that's amazing about it is because um as you guys know i've i travel quite a lot i've been to a few countries my my fair share of uh party traveling all that malarkey and the one thing that i've stopped doing especially the i think the the time before last i went to berlin i've been to berlin last year 2017 i've been maybe like five years in a row or some shit right so i think when i went in 2017 i decided to rent uh i decided to go and book a hostel because i wanted to save some money on accommodation and i quickly realized why i wouldn't book a hostel again in berlin because berlin isn't really a hostel city some cities are but berlin isn't i think for the most part um you can find housing or you can find beds or sofa beds in quite amazing apartments or amazing buildings for pretty cheap and maybe for the equivalency that you might get for a hostel the only reason why you maybe go to a hostel is similar to why you might go to a hotel is that you can probably check in later um it's automated you don't have to wait for somebody outside of their house and call them or text them or meet them outside of a coffee shop right it's not you know the the key exchange thing in airbnb is something they still haven't really figured out too well there's been there was one place i went to, i think maybe it was prague or somewhere where they saw that pretty well there was an off license next door um to the apartment and essentially that person was essentially the kind of building manager so they had the key and they kind of give you all the information give you a pamphlet of the wi-fi code and all the local attraction you could go to so essentially you always knew where to go pick up your key regardless of what time you got in that shop was always open right so go to kind of you to pick up your keys so um that is a good way of doing the whole airbnb thing but it's not really been worked out too well so sometimes hostels can serve a purpose in that way and of course because they're cheap right and sometimes well, there's a benefit that you might bump into some mates that you can kind of go out with for the most part though when i'm going to places like berlin or to go party cities i'm not necessarily going there to make friends i'm going there just to have a good time and go to the actual club if i can meet people at the club who i can get friendly with and chat with and hang out with that's amazing but i'm not really make, looking to make like city friends to go out for coffee i'm just going there to party like basically all day long but then i realized how why i didn't like it because it was just full of so many young people right hostels are the you know the accommodation of the young i think 25 and under you know you want to save as much money as you can every anything you can shave off your spending budget or any money you can save to add onto your spending budget you're going to do it but obviously being you know an older dude and staying in a hostel surrounded by young loads of kids wasn't really the best vibe and again i didn't really enjoy it you know you're, you're always forced to get out of your room because you know you're lying down in bed and people around you are talking. i don't know it's just a strange place to be right i don't really like it but what i like about his pod share stuff is that essentially because it's aimed at uh, millennials quote unquote who are getting their um getting their first kind of steps on the ladder and trying to build their career up and trying to build some experience or trying to get a startup off the ground you essentially have people that even though they might be young on age on paper sorry they're a lot more mature in real life because they're having to do some real life shit they're paying rent right twelve hundred dollars a month is not nothing to love is nothing to smirk at right it's still you know doubled what i'm paying here to live in stratford so imagine for a single occupancy person even though they might be earning a lot two thousand three thousand dollars a month still it doesn't leave you that much after you paid most of your rent most of your rent um has gone through your you know monthly um wages that you get but obviously you get to have a network of people similar to why people would want to go and have you know a desk at we work is that you're hoping that the network 
is going to be as valuable as the space that you're renting right being surrounded by people that are doing interesting cool stuff that you can maybe converse with over the coffee machine or during Thursday drinks it's something that a lot of startups are kind of very very kind of conscious of or aware of and I think this does a really good job of doing it so you get a bit more of a maturer atmosphere you'd hope so living in a project because I think that's the only thing I'd be a bit wary about is the kind of pure lunacy around it but it looks like for the most part everyone here is quite well adjusted let's continue this location has two bathrooms and this one's currently being used <laughs> so I won't show you the bathroom but I will show you the pods in each pod you can see here there's obviously a mattress pillows linens your essentials this is my pod right here as most people know like housing. it's a bit cringe that he's got his app name on there right like his Twitter and Instagram that's a bit cringe but hey so essentially it's a, it's a bunk bed like a bigger bunk bed like a double um, there's a TV there's some hangers on the side and a, a couple of, you know, shelves that you can probably, cubes that you can probably stick some stuff in. So, again, the bare minimums that you need to kind of keep yourself, you know, uh, well put together. I'm sure it, maybe there's some extra storage underneath the beds they could use. But if you've got more, cl and I don't know, someone like me that has you know, a few pieces of clothing and maybe probably more trainers than these guys have hoodies, right? Because everyone here is wearing a hoodie. But... I don't know where he'd put all that stuff. I guess you have to downsize it. So that's probably the thing you have to look out for if you've got main possessions. Maybe it isn't the best thing for you. But again, pretty decent bed, I think, for the most part. Looks pretty comfortable. I'm not mad at it. In San Francisco is chaos. I founded a company called Flipmas. We do Instagram influencer advertising. Our business does pretty well. I actually pay myself really conservatively. I earn about $3,000 per month. I tried living in San Francisco on that budget. I was able to do it, but it was really, really hard. Contra model is really for myself, which is solo, single, no children, no pets, you know, like I'm really just building something I want to live in. As a software engineer, I can definitely afford this place. I can have savings as well. And at the same time, I am getting all the value that the city holds. And I guess that's that's the main factor of it. It's not the fact that, you know, I think it's weird because San Fran, I mentioned before in another video, San Fran is like, you know, they've had this amazing, they have this really bad problem, not amazing, bad problem with homelessness in San Francisco, right? The startups came in, they essentially bought up all the free space, all the free buildings, which drove the rent super crazy, which then drove the, you know, the overall cost of living up really crazy. But then obviously startups pay really well in San Francisco to accommodate for it. So they end up in a really tricky situation where the most basic of housing costs you, you know, way more than it would do anywhere else in America just because this is in San Francisco. But I guess what the good thing about Podshare is, and number one, they've got locations all across San Fran, which is great, right? So you could stay in multiple locations depending on where your startup is located to save some money on travel and all that malarkey. And you can actually save money on your rent because it's cheaper than what you'd pay. Maybe it's half the, the monthly rent that you'd usually pay for an apartment, right? Or for a room in San Francisco. So already you, you can save some money and you can also say you can save some money on rent, and you can also save put your money in savings, as this guy mentioned right now, right? Which is something a lot of people don't really tend, especially younger people. I've I've been in the same position when you're starting your career. The last thing you're thinking about is saving. You just want to spend and get kind of your feet on the ladder. But this kind of does a good way of kind of encapsulating those two things. And again, I, I'm I'm a big fan of it. I don't really see the issue personally. I think if you're young, if you don't have any any dependence and you don't have any other responsibilities apart from getting your foot on the ladder and kind of building up your experience. And essentially, if you're starting a startup from the ground up, right, it's just you and your founder or you and your on your smartphone or you and your MacBook. Like the last thing you need is to, you know, uh, be paying absorbent amount of rent. You just need to kind of, you know, get somewhere where you can put your rest your head, send some emails and just keep on trucking. And go off cold and they might get like taken back a little uh, in the sense that it might be not as much privacy in comparison to if they own a home. But I'm just a bachelor. I'm a new grad. Bachelor, and yeah. Really don't matter at the moment. What's about that, bro? So the hardest thing about living in a place like this is that you give up your privacy. That's something that you do have to get used to once you start. By the way, come on through. Oh yeah, yeah, go through. Nice. Nah, yeah, talk about privacy. There is no alone time, then, right? There is no time. You know, that's the one thing you. Re Again, I think when you're older, it's one thing that you start to realize how much... Yeah, when you're older, it's like camping, right? When I went to Download Festival, super fun. I was considering to go again. Then I saw pictures of how muddy and wet it was this year. But it still looked like fun. But it comes a time when you're just a bit over it. You're a bit over putting yourself in such uncomfortable and such sticky situations. You'd rather just, like, chill. And that's it. Um, you'd rather chill in some adequate luxury, especially if you're earning a good amount of money. So that's a thing that you probably have to be conscious of. Maybe it depends on what stage in your life you're in or how you are or your taste in terms of traveling. 
Some people are like, you know, spontaneous. Some people like the whole planning thing. Some people are just to kind of, you know, um, go to the thing that's only rated highly on TripAdvisor and shit. It depends where, where you kind of lean. I don't really mind being a bit, you know, a little bit fly by a suit of my pants and it being a little bit sporadic and, you know, being a little bit hip and shit or whatever, maybe you call it cringe. So I wouldn't mind doing it personally. But again, the previous stuff, like getting out of the shower and having to change in the shower or walking across your room naked and people staying, it's just, uh, you am not too sure about that. But then you find ways to reclaim your privacy. Fortunately, in this location, it's four floors and there are plenty of places to hang out. There's certain things you have to give up when you want to live in the center and, and pay no security deposit, and that's privacy here. Yeah, exactly. I think what people get wrong about PodShare is that the pod is all they have and that they don't have access to like amenities. I've actually had people mock me for this type of living arrangement. I think many people might think that it, I don't know, is it dystopian to like group a bunch of people into one living space? But I think it's one of those don't knock it till you try it type of things. Agreed. I think if prices become more affordable, posture will die, and that's okay. Because I think it's here to solve a problem. And um, if the rents ever became normalized, then then I don't know if a posture would be necessary because everyone would just get their own private place. And that's okay. I like her, man. See, that's a founder that you need. Like, again, providing a service that people actually need, right? And not some, you know, bullshit Uber for fucking bicycles or I don't know, just some other crap that people saw people do. And again, it's a, it's a service that is only going to be sustainable depending on the market, right? She's obviously made a little niche for herself because the market is crazy. Housing prices have got absorbed in it. So there is a small population of people, young people with the high disposable income, who are willing to kind of forego some luxuries in order to live in a city of their choice, right in the heart of things, next to their startup. Because that's the thing that I realize as well with startups too, is that sometimes um, they might not pay well, but the experience is so valuable that you'd rather work there for shit money just to get a good experience on your cv so imagine if you worked at facebook right and they decided to give you an internship and you got a thousand pounds a month you would do that in a heartbeat because you know what that facebook name could do for your career going forward if you're that way inclined for job wise or if you want to even just work there to get some experience so you can put it into your your bit your own business which i don't really agree we should probably just start your business instead of trying to work through it but imagine anyway anyway you cut it a year of experience getting paid a thousand a month is probably quite valuable but the problem that you run into is that it's only valuable if you live or work if you live basically near the office right if you have to travel or commute in and you're paying i don't know 150 pounds a month for your travel it suddenly that doesn't become as as much worth it anymore right you have to even if a bicycle is too far you're sweating on the way there so you kind of have to live within that catchment area to make it worthwhile or to make it worth your trouble um so with that being said it being in the heart of san francisco silicon valley and these kind of stops are around there everyone's building their startups from there for the most part it still has that cachet it hasn't really died out it's a perfect it's a perfect thing and i think over time we might maybe see something sim happening in london because even though we don't have, really have a centralized startup scene, you know, they tried to make one with Silicon Valley. I mean, with Silicon Roundabout, that didn't really work out too well. Um, there's not many startups there. They're mostly small businesses or marketing agencies and shit. So it's a bit, you know, it's a bit of a misnomer. Um, there's a f- some few, there's a few where I work at, there's a few fintech ones, but they're not really fintech. They're mostly, you know, big corporations that essentially, um, you know, have satellite offices that are working on smaller projects. But if there was a centralized startup scene in London, I guess this would be a perfect thing. But even if there isn't, I think if you located a few pod share apartments in East London, South London, West London, North London, I'm sure it'll be completely booked up, 100%. Especially if you had a couple of locations similar to that like WeWork, like they would get absolutely booked up in no, no way, shape or form. So yeah, I really like it. Really recommend you check it out. Pod share, a great little startup um, by this lady. What was her name again? Let me get up on here so I can give her a shout out because she smashed it. Um, Elvina Beck, CEO of Podshare. I'll link the video on the show so you guys can check out. But yeah, really, really cool idea. And again, something that I'm very, very, very much down with. Um, da, 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 boom. I guess that'd be it, you know, for the show because I need to jet off back to work, unfortunately. But before I go, a little update on my DJing. Unfortunately, this Friday is the last, the last, last, last tapped at Tap East for the foreseeable future. Um, we had a pretty good run. I'm, a, I'm gonna say, I think it was like a year of events, basically. I think it's a year, right? Let me check my resident advisor because I always put my events up on here. Let me see how many events we had. So we started when? Let me see. Tap. Uh, da, 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 da. Where, is it? where is it where is it we started in 
July, yeah, so it's been a year now, one year, mama mia, that's amazing, isn't it? So it started in July 2018, uh, playing at Tapis, our first actual performance, I think so, the first one was in the 20th of uh, July. Um, again, a great opportunity, something I'm very, very, always be um, grateful for. It gave me the chance to play every Friday for, uh, you know, a captive audience, people that were not necessarily there to see me at all, they were there just to kind of have their pints and go home. But I got a chance to play in front of them. I got a chance to play in front of adults. Again, people that I wanted to play in front of. I think I mentioned it a few times that I think the whole playing in Dawson Shoreditch thing is easy. I've done it for a lot of years. Again, there is a skill in it. Don't get me wrong. But I think it's not much of a challenge for most DJs. I think if, you're, if you've got a good ear and you've got a good taste in music, you can probably smash it in the Shoreditch Club. Because for the most part, people they just get fucked up. They have a good knowledge base of the trendy or of the popular electronic music that are out there. <coughs> and release this so you know it's easy to kind of make them happy but i think playing in a pub um or playing in a bar with people that are not necessarily into the music and just want to have a good time is a lot hot a lot, diff- lot more difficult especially with the varying age groups and the different backgrounds of malarkey they're not really necessarily working cool jobs or listening to cool p- playlists when they're at work and just general regular smegal everyday people so to make those people dance and to make them like what you play has been a blessing you know i started off the that set in tapis the first few months were like you know request heavy everyone requesting 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 something because i want to say they're playing what they liked and then over time you gain their trust because they see you every friday they, they they realize that you know even though i might be not be playing what they want right now you know at hour one they know they can trust and believe within hour two or three or four that i'm definitely gonna play something that's gonna fit into their likelihood and as i mentioned just there I got a chance to play four hour sets, man. This would have been a dream of mine. Ever since I've kind of got into electronic music and started reading interviews with Dixon and Ricardo Villa Lobos and Zip and Move D and God Yance, all these kind of people that I'm looking up to when I first got into the scene. Every interview that I read from these people kind of eulogize about the early Berlin scene um, and how that basically cultivated or made them sharpen their uh, DJing skills, right? By requiring them to play extended sets, right? There's no such thing in Berlin as the one hour or 50 minute set that we have here in London, right? Where someone turns up late, even for an hour set and just plays bang after bang after bang after an hour. That's not something that they do. I guess because in Berlin or in, in European countries, they have, you know, more relaxed licensing laws, bars are able to open late until later. So they don't necessarily need to rush, whereas it may be in London because, you know, most bars outside of London close at one or two, um, some in London close at four but not a lot of them so they have to kind of rush through the sets and people don't really come out until late but um, the education that you get the, the sharpening of your DJ abilities playing longer sets cannot be denied playing longer sets in front of people who don't want to see you cannot be denied either so I'm really grateful for the opportunity again um, it might come back again after a while but you know they're going to review the situation and see if it's going to be worthwhile for them which I can completely understand in that regard but again great opportunity and I'm really thankful for it so with that being said the last one is happening this Friday on the 12th of July at Tap E so if you're in the area come through for the last ever um, tapped at Westfield Stratford again myself um, myself Hanson Blackman alongside Afro Musa from 5 until 11 um, and that will be me for the time being um anyway um that is it man for the action zinger show episode number 217 again a pl- project for a short episode today but you know needs must go get back to work tomorrow will be a bit of a longer one um as always if you need anything regarding myself check out my website actionzinger.com with all my dls all my dj gigs social media links all that malarkey if you have any questions regarding the show put them down in the comments if you're listening via the audio podcast leave me a five-star review i appreciate the ones that have been there um, that have been added recently much much appreciate it's going to help people find the show and as always i'll see you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show and take care guys be safe bye